don't know languages from this period. So there was a political project to create a place called Lebanon. Uh, and it's also a geographical distinction, the mountains there, which are the highest mountains between uh, Sinai and the Taurus Mountains in Southwest Anatolia. Uh, it will refer to as Lebanon in, in, in the Bible, for instance. So this is also a very old geographic designation. But so in 1861, the autonomous district of Mount Lebanon is created after uh, another sectarian civil war that I'll talk about, and it lasts until 1918. It was about a third of the size of the contemporary forters of Lebanon, which are established under French auspices in 1920. Both of these districts were by design Christian majority. So what do I mean by autonomous? That means that there was a governor of Mount Lebanon who had to be Catholic, but couldn't be Lebanese. And this was an autonomy negotiated between European quote unquote great powers in the Ottoman Empire. Can you give an example, please? Like Catholic? Sure. Who? If it's an Armenian, so like the, oh. the, the last side so of, of, of Mount Lebanon is, is, is Armenian. So yeah, just, just any Ottoman Catholics from elsewhere in, in the empire were, were eligible to, to, to govern the, the territory. So I'm going to historicize the creation of Lebanon. I am not assuming this as a coherent geographical unit. In the Civil War that I made reference to, just cut off, unfortunately, by that Zoom tab at the top, is the 1860 Druze Maronite Civil War, which ultimately spreads to Damascus. And this is actually a photograph of um, the Algerian Abdul Qadr saving Christians in, in Damascus. So first of all, who are the Maronites? The Maronites are Lebanese Catholics. They are one with the church, or with one, they're, it's a uniate church. So they um, are under the like so greater sovereignty of Rome, but they have their own liturgy. What does that mean in practice? It means that uh, Lebanese Maronite priests can marry before they're fraught, for instance. And after Vatican II, they have their liturgy in Arabic. So a fully Catholic church, but also fully Lebanese instance. Their antagonists in the Civil War are the Druze. Can anybody help me with who the Druze are? Druze? Druze. Druze. I'm sorry, I say things in English when I speak in, yeah, I speak the Druze. Mm -hmm. They're, they're like a religious sect. Very they're ancient they're religious sect. Yeah. And they're very pri very private and secretive. There you go. Um, absolutely. And, and they've, so the American Druze Foundation has funded a fellowship here at the center. And if you're the American Druze Foundation fellow, like I was for two years, you can study everything except Druze theology. Because the theological questions are, in theory, still private. However, the secret holy books of the Druze are fully available on the internet. So the cat's kind of out of the bag in terms of what the Druze believe. The Druze uh, evolved from Ismaili Islam. Yeah. It's an offshoot of uh, Shia Islam. Mm -hmm. um, so clearly Islamic in origins, although not all Druze and not all Muslims consider the Druze to be Muslims, if, if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. In this 19th century context, the Druze have sort of adopt the British mm -hmm. and the British yeah. adopt the Druze as their property. Mm -hmm. And which imperial power um, does business with the Maronites? Which imperial power cultivates the Maronites as a proxy? Absolutely, France. So that part of uh, so that that's really crucial context to this conflagration here. I'm going to talk all the way through what happens during the Civil War, but first let me step back and just say that. And I know you've talked about this already this week. The Ottoman Tanzi map, this Ottoman era of reform beginning in 1839, culminating in 1856, is about the construction of a modern state that among other things, gives equality to citizens regardless of religion. An ironic outcome of this reform is that you have increasing sectarian violence in the Levant and beyond. 1860, in 1860, in Mount Lebanon and Damascus is probably the most prominent example of this. So I'm going to try to think through why this is happening. Why do you have this creation of equality between citizens? Do you have the undermining of the sectarian factor? And it's really important to stop here because the, the answer that you would read in the New York Times from somebody like Thomas Friedman is we don't need to explain this. These people have always been fighting each other. Don't think too hard about it. 
that's not helpful in the classroom, right? Because we have to account for why this is happening at a particular time. What historical forces are, are leading to this? Because um, for good reasons, people like to kind of avoid this story and sidestep it because it risks playing into stereotypes about the region. I think with students, it's good to meet these uh, sorts of questions head on. Glaring among which is, for instance, in Palestine, at the beginning of the 20th century, the population is about 20% Christian. That number is down below 2% now. At the beginning of the 20th century, one in four residents of Baghdad is Jewish. That population has basically totally disappeared. At the beginning of the 20th century, the population of Anatolia is about 20% Christian. That population has almost totally disappeared. So how do we account for that? I do not think that we can find the answers, although people oftentimes look for them there in the deep past, in the seventh century. This sectarianism is a modern phenomenon and needs to be understood as such. So it has something to do with the political economy of imperialism. And what do I mean by that? You have winners and losers amidst this big economic expansion in the 19th century. A lot of the perceived winners in migration, in economic integration are minorities, are Christians, are Jewish populations if that makes sense. So you have the creation of a new middle class, um, a lot of new prosperity, but also a lot of instability that's introduced into these places that are most connected to the global economy. And Lebanon is absolutely at the forefront of those. So and people seem to be aware of the Egyptian sort of dimension of, of, of these issues. Mehmed Ali Pasha, who we think of as the ruler of Egypt, the founder of the Egyptian nation. Uh, that's a little misleading because he was ethnically Albanian. Ethnically Albanian, Albanian right? Born in what's now Greece, spoke Albanian, never spoke Arabic, formal Arabic or Egyptian Arabic. Uh, and he tries to make Egypt into a counterweight to European powers. And he wants to industrialize. And because of some sort of military misadventures that he participates in on behalf of the Ottoman Sultan, he turns against the Sultan and invades the Levant. Mm -hmm. This is because he's angry about wasting his navy in Greece and sending his army to the Hejaz on behalf of the Sultan, and the Sultan didn't hold up his side of the bargain. So Muhammad Ali Pasha rebels mm -hmm. against the Ottoman Empire. And what, what do you need to industrialize? Like what, what resources, was, resources, and water. metals, oil, yeah, so well, coal, and coal. And there's no coal in Egypt, right? And they have to buy coal bad terms. Like there's no, there's no way that the British Empire is going to let Egypt become a counterweight to its regional power. So they invade Lebanon, and this is odd from our perspective, in large part looking for coal and timber for its navy. There's no coal in Lebanon's mountains, but they didn't know that then. There's late night there. So uh, his son leads these armies, Ibrahim Pasha, and they rule over the Levant uh, between uh, in the 1830s, really for the whole decade of the, of, of the 1830s. And, and this is when you have a situation where he could have marched all the way to Constantinople and into the Ottoman Empire, but the British sort of prefer to keep the Ottoman Empire around. Wow. But they make the Sultan sign in 1838 a free trade agreement that gives very good terms to European traders and very bad terms to the Ottoman Empire. So this is a key force behind economic integration of the Ottoman economy with Europe on bad terms. So you have this deindustrialization of workshop level production in the Ottoman Empire. And that, so this is, this is a, a really important piece of the puzzle, what's going on in Lebanon. Well, Bashir Shahab is the emir in 1788 and 1840, religiously ambiguous. He played both sides. This is really important. We, religion is very clear and binary these days in Lebanon as elsewhere. He was ambiguously Sunni Muslim or Maronite Christian. So they say, so this kind of, but in the modern period, you can't, you can't, you can't do that anymore. And so here are the, before the middle of, uh, the 19th century, Lebanon was divided like this. Bashir Shahab paid taxes to the Pasha of Sidon, who paid taxes to the Ottoman Empire. So you have these levels of political power. The Ottoman State 
Governor of Saudi, Prince Bashir Shahab, and then you have sheikhs, landowners, and the peasants who work for them. So what happens during this period of reform? After 1842, the restoration of Ottoman control, European powers come in, and they, in their minds, who lives in Lebanon? Well, you have Druze and you have Maronites. So of course you should distribute political power on that basis. So the legitimate basis for political power becomes religion. This is new. Religion becomes, as has been called, the site of colonial encounter. This is the genesis of the political system that Lebanon has until today. After the US invasion of Iraq in 2003, what kind of political system did they set up in the country? A sectarian political system. It always reproduces that sectarianism at its foundation. This has been cycles of this that have happened through the history of Lebanon. So I think, I, on the one hand, this is obvious, but I, we have to scream it from the mountaintops. If you organize political systems like this, you're going to create this problem that's going to appear to be age old, but really is down to this modern democratic political structure. So they make a Christian Kamkamiya and a Druze Kamkamiya in the south. But this is bizarre because can you see that the shaded zone here, those are mixed districts. The Druze are a minority even in the mixed districts. Mm -hmm. So it's like um, in the Balkans, the same thing. This, imagine, this imagination that, oh, Muslims live in Bosnia, Orthodox Christians live in Serbia, Catholics live in Croatia. Mm -hmm. When the reality on the ground is these places are very new stuff, even between villages. Mm -hmm. So when you have this kind of plan, when you're making plans with these religious units as sort of the functional basis, things go awry in a very predictable way. And yet, when taking the Balkans as an example, when you try and do a Yugoslavia type and shove them all together, that doesn't work well either. And so that's always the that's always the premise, right? If can these people live together? I history says that people in all of these places have been living together like this for a very long time. So almost the Levant is like, or, or Lebanon in particular, was exceptionally diverse and resiliently so. Um, but we always remember these periods of things going wrong. And so I risk sort of doubling down on that by drawing attention to them here. But from the Islamic conquests, uh, 12 centuries later, you have Muslim Christians and Jews living in relative harmony. And the piece I always have to step back and emphasize here, if you had to randomly jump in the time machine as a Jewish person and get plopped down in Europe before the 20th century, or plop down somewhere in the Islamic world, where would you choose? Yeah. So like, we don't want to make this seem like harmonious coexistence that conforms to our contemporary understanding of human rights and equality, because of course it doesn't, right? But this was a pretty stable system until it gets shaken up in the 19th century, isn't it? I don't mean to interrupt, but you mentioned like engagement with yeah. Oh, yeah, um, what you just mentioned uh, reminded me of one of the lectures that we um, um, attended this week and the professor then shared many maps of others, outsiders of the Arab world, reimagining and redividing the Arab world based on so many, basically ethnic, religion, religious, whatever. And this just takes us very a, little, a step closer to understanding uh, more why is this happening in, in our century, in the 21st century, when it had roots. Back in the 19th century, for one, what I read here is one thing, politics, recreation of the state to serve one particular project, sure. political project, big okay. one. Absolutely, and right, so, so this is just having a Christian zone and a Druze zone. This, this looks exactly like the maps that you're describing from the 20th century and the 21st century, sort of redividing up the Middle East in a different way. It served the interest of some British diplomats in France, what they imagined to be their national interest. But and this is what the podcast wanted to come back to. 
that project has collaborators on the ground, right? Yes. That has like sectarian entrepreneurs on the ground who are equally invested for a different set of reasons. So we don't want to take away, I don't want to overemphasize imperialism and take away um, the agency of, of, of those people. But the biggest fiction, what that rolls up against is the idea that Maronites and Christians are united, right? We do the same thing in, in our own um, sort of sectarian imagination in the United States. We talk in these terms of these groups and it makes them seem like coherent wholes when there's a project for them to be a coherent whole, but they're not, in fact. The geography of Mount Lebanon helps us understand what goes wrong with this. These are huge ravines. This is village by village. The Christian community doesn't exist as such. The Druze community doesn't exist as such, but that doesn't mean that a political project a colonial political project to organize uh, social life in the Eastern Mediterranean on that basis wasn't very real. That makes sense. We can hold that contradiction kind of in, in, in our heads. And so these are the kind of ravines that I'm talking about. This isn't very accessible territory. Something else is happening in the 19th century that, that is motivating these British and French diplomats to be um, sectarian entrepreneurs. And that's this huge explosion of commerce. This is value of traffic at the very point, which you see is increasing exponentially uh, between 1825 is the first date there and 1860 is the second date. The commodity. You know, what are they producing? Silk. Raw silk. So, whereas silk production is very old in the Eastern Mediterranean, they aren't making finished products anymore. They're producing the cocoons, which has to happen really close to mulberry orchards. And this is happening in family settings. And then women and girls are unraveling those in small factories and sending the raw silk to Leon to be fully processed. So at the beginning, I talked about the falling rate of profit. There's this big boom. It creates a new middle class. It creates a lot of prosperity. But then in the 1870s, um, Lebanon can't really compete with East Asian producers. The price of silk starts to fall. This is what motivates migration to the Americas. One in three Lebanese have left and gone to the Americas by the First World War. So the 1860 revolt begins not as a Maronite Druze conflict. This is Tanya Shaheen, he was a muleteer. So muleteers were peasants under a specific lord. They, they went from place to place, they brought news, they brought goods. So they're sort of the transportation network, right? A man and a mule who was like uh, yeah, a driver, basically. He leads Maronite peasants in an uprising against their Maronite lords in 1858. So this begins this class conflict in a specific place in Mount Lebanon in Kesser Web, and it becomes sectarianized. The Druze lords convinced their peasants to fight with them against the Christians. It, the conflict initially breaks out in central Lebanon and the Medan, then it spreads to the Bekaa Valley, to Rashaya Hasbaya, and Damascus, to Zahle, to the Al-Ambad. And in Zahle, you have Christians who are waiting for other Christians to come and save them. Even the Druze number, you know, many fewer people. It was disunity among the Christians that causes them to lose the war. The Ottoman Empire comes and intervenes. But France still invades Lebanon after that to save Christians. We keep on coming. So th this is a theme that we can take from the 19th century into the 20th century, into the 21st century. And I'll go ahead and sort of spill the beans on my view of this. When a European empire claims to be acting to protect Christians, they almost always end up exposing those communities to, to harm if that makes sense. So it was precisely the vision that the Maronites were proxies of France that exposes them to violence. Yes. Like the invasion of Iraq uh, in the, tw uh, in the um, 21st century uh, under the umbrella of saving the Iraqis from the undemocratic. Right. What's happened, well, that's right. yeah, what's happened to the Christian communities of, of Iraq since 2003 is uh, so a, a, really, yeah, like a really horrible example of the theme that I'm, I'm yeah, talking mm -hmm. about. So uh, when I talk to students, I, I think we can't just have this kind of sectarianism be a problem that's over there. So I like to point out that in the middle of the 19th century, there was also a plan to create equality among the citizens of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. A lot of people believed in this, white and black. They thought 
Well, that's a great idea. So the same thing is happening in the Ottoman Empire. You have peasants saying, Tansy Matt sounds great. Let's assert our rights as citizens in this place. And um, elites sort of need to put the genie back in the bottle, right? The system needs to recreate hierarchies in this context of enormous economic expansion to organize labor. And so how do you do that in the US? It's through race, right? And you have violence and like especially spectacular paramilitary violence that I think deserves to be seen um, in the same sort of uh, frame of reference as the, the like sectarian paramilitary violence that's happening against civilians in Mount Lebanon in 1860. The point of which is to put people back in those boxes. That makes sense. When violence happens, people take sides. When violence happens between groups, people are willing to adopt that group in a sectarian group or an ethnic group <laughs> as their primary mode of identification. I'm not saying there was a great conspiracy by elites for this to happen. I'm just describing that the function is to discourage class-based alliances against elites, if that makes sense. So three ironic outcomes of this, this attempt at centralization, reduced Ottoman sovereignty in Mount Lebanon, Modernization, which is supposed to be rational, creates this unpredictable, uncontrolled spasm of religious violence. Yeah. And then finally, as we've talked about, and this is a great theme to bring that we brought, you brought really nicely into the 21st century, that France's attempt to bring Catholic communities under their protection backfired and made them the target for systematic retaliation. So this is sectarianism as I see it. Uh, the book to read about this is The Culture of Sectarianism, Basama Matisi's um, really masterful work on this. And, and here's a pithy quotation. This context of flux created the conditions for sectarianism to arise, not as a coherent force, but as a reflection of fractured identities, pulled hither and thither by the enticements and coercions of Ottoman and European power. It's sort of a heavy read. He's come out with some other stuff since that, that, that maybe is a little more um, accessible. I would encourage you to read this, but I probably wouldn't give it to um, high school students. Uh, and I wrote uh, with a friend, uh, I wrote uh, this editorial about Syria, which draws on some of the same ideas. The Syrian conflagration was understood to be, oh, there are these different kinds of Muslims in Syria, and that's why this is happening. I, I don't think that's... Um, a very good explanation for the Syrian civil war because it puts the cart before the horse, if you will. So we have to find explanations for why things are happening at a particular time and not just assume that the presence of diversity is the call for conflict. Really, is it pretty intuitive when we think about our own society, right? So if we have about 17 minutes left. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to go to the political economy of imperialism number two and tell you about why famine happens in Lebanon. They killed one in three people. Uh, this is the biggest per capita loss of life anywhere in the world during the First World War. In Serbia, about one in four people die. Um, in, West in, in East Africa, excuse me, you have really high death rates. But there was no major combat in Lebanon. So this becomes sort of uh, a story about uh, the fallout from war in places where combat isn't happening at all. I'm going to talk about the predominant interpretation of the famine, which has been sectarian and national, and then suggest what it reveals about the history of Lebanon, the Middle East, and the globe. Had you ever heard of this before? I love talking about it. But I bet you've heard about the Armenian genocide. Right? Yes. So this is why it's interesting. In, in, in 2019, there's a U.S. House resolution that says ah, the campaign of genocide against the Armenians and Maronites. Just kind of odd to throw that in there, right? If this isn't like something that people know about. Seems like an afterthought. I think that's because um, I fully accept the first part of that formulation, but I'm going to reject the second part while saying it's not outlandish that the Ottomans were doing this to another Christian population in the empire, right? This is a plausible explanation. I just don't think it explains why one in three Lebanese starved to death during the war. So 
when, when Lebanese people learn about this, they usually learn about it through uh, this movie, Sefer Berlik, which came out in the late 60s. Feiruz, the diva, famous Lebanese diva, Feiruz is the singer here. And this Ottoman soldier sort of plays the part of Jamal Pasha. I bet you heard about Jamal earlier in the week when Mustafa talked. Okay, good. So this is like Jamal. Um, you do write Jamal. He's um, he's fictionalized here in the, in, in the characters uh, Rifat Ben. But who did they find in 1960s Lebanon to sort of speak this like broken Turkish Arabic other than an Armenian actor displaying this character? But the movie depicts is this movement of armed resistance of Lebanese against the Ottomans. No such thing happened. But it's <laughs> interesting that they took the time to, to, to invent it. Um, there were some nationalists who were hung in downtown Beirut and Damascus in 1916. And as far as collective memory of the war goes, um, people think about those elite men um, who were punished for their sort of like uh, proto-nationalist organizing by Jamal during the war. They broke into the US, uh, they broke into the, the, the French lead, and, but they didn't burn their documents. And so the Ottomans break in and they go through the whole archive of the French consulate in Beirut. And they basically find lists of people who've been talking to French diplomats. And that's what happens to these like 26 martyrs of the nation. But I think this very elite oriented narrative in Lebanon, but also everywhere in the region that's encapsulated here in Martyr Square is under attack. And the Arab Spring is a testament to that fact. People are saying in the streets, we don't accept this story that all of our suffering comes from outside. Not because it's totally wrong, but because the work it does is to absolve local elites from their complicity in the misfortunes of the region. So in tandem with that, there was a big openness in archives that hadn't happened before. These archives, this is where I worked in, 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 in Lebanon, mostly in, in private ecclesiastical archives, had been closed, I think, because people were protecting some kind of local actors, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. so about the time of Arab Spring, and the really uh, simple way to put it is people get tired of protecting those people. Um, mm -hmm. And so here's uh, the daily register of a monastery. Uh, this is a great Catholic monastery, which is right there north of Beirut near Junye. There's a big virgin on the hill there, if you know mm -hmm. Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, that's, where the, that's where their monastery is. This guy's a Lepin. Um, he becomes patriarch of Greek Catholics uh, in Lebanon. He uh, participates in Vatican II. Either right here, as a young man, I have his daily notes from the war. And what do they contain? but a very iconoclastic, what now seems to be an iconoclastic interpretation of why the famine happened. He writes, the Turks did not commit a fraction of the evil. He anticipates how people are gonna explain this. The Turks did this to us for being Christians or Arabs, et cetera. They were, they were the reason for the neglect of many, oh, that local elites did. And he names names like local strong men in Judea. They were the reason for the neglect of many and the murder of many and the death by starvation of thousands because they sold wheat destined for the war. So basically enough grain is going into Lebanon during this time, but your mouth strategy for having it distributed is to rely on local elite networks. And the price is high, so there's this huge opportunity to make money in an economy that's characterized by the social relations of capitalism, uniquely, I think, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, you find this in the Ottoman archive too. Here's the governor of Damascus saying, I am going to stop sending grain to Beirut because a click, he says, of merchants are putting private over public interests. So when you look in the contemporary archive, a very different story emerges than what we find in the traditional interpretation. It emphasizes class conflict and not national conflict. We don't want to let the French off the hook here because what are they up to? They're blockading the coast and preventing grain shipments from moving um, around the Ottoman Empire as they had primarily by boat. And we, we found the smoking gun in the French archive where the, the Red Cross in the United States, the government of Spain, they want to bring relief in like they did for Poland and like they did for Belgium. And then who says, no, you can't bring relief through our blockade lines. The French, the Ottomans are willing to accept it. But the French say the more they starve, the more they'll hate the Ottomans and the more they'll accept us as wow. uh, 
uh, the, the more they'll accept uh, the imposition of our colonial rule after the war. That works. The it's British still happening. Was, mm -hmm. yeah. it's still happening. It's like still right. happening. absolutely. Oh, um, so like the British army marches, marches into Palestine with people yelling "Welcome" in English. Mm -hmm. They're happy to see the British army because they had started to starve. Starvation begins in Mount Lebanon in 1915, but spreads throughout the region and cripples the Ottoman Empire. Uh, why is Lebanon particularly susceptible to this? Uh, because they relied on remittances from the Americas as their biggest source of income, followed by silk and other. So you see here the sources of prosperity, but also instability. And this isn't capitalism, it's capitalism everywhere. This is capitalism in Lebanon, which is absolutely a satellite of France. So when those connections with France are cut off, they really feel it. And that's why France is then accepted as a colonial power, not because Maronites love France, you know, French, <laughs> the Arab nation and stuff like that. I think that's a lazy explanation. Um, so grain imports to Lebanon are cut off. Here again, the death rate. So I have some stuff I don't have time to get to about the silk economy. We could talk about that in more detail. Something exciting is in the US archive here, I found this ledger of um, remittances sent during the war. Remittances were totally cut off. And they have, they have like names of villages and recipients. So we were able to map these and show that while migration and remittances, this is not a phenomenon limited to Mount Lebanon, it was primarily focused there in quantitative terms. So the average resident of Mount Lebanon received 30 cents between 1915 and 1917 from their relatives in the States. In Beirut province, that was 19 cents. And that number is distorted by that big green blob there, which are Jewish communities in Northern Palestine, American Jewish communities in Northern Palestine, who are getting a lot of money from the States. Um, but you see in the interior of Syria, really people are, are getting remittances, but at a much lower rate. Um, and then, I like to talk about this family because it's it's kind of striking. They were in Dothan, Alabama. They had become um, very wealthy in Dothan and dry goods, like a lot of Lebanese had, had done well in the grocery business, to put it simply. Um, and like a, and it's it's a good story of migration because it, it, it brings together a lot of threads. They wanted to go back. Most people who came to the United States wanted to make some money and, and, and they go back home. They do go back home right before the war and the father dies. But what's striking here is how accepted they were in white society in the deepest South, right? So these people were on the white side of the color line. Mm -hmm. so Isn't that part of why they were able to immigrate? Because they were labeled white instead of Totally. Yeah. You know. But what happens, um, and I see this as part and parcel of global economic crisis of the early 20th century, is that there's a rise of nativism as things go back. So you see, and I'll show you another picture um, in, in, in a second to, to drive this home, is that this strategy of migrating gets harder when you can no longer go from Beirut to the United States. So there's lots of barriers to mobility. I don't want to be reductive about that, but the last one, U.S. immigration restrictions, 1917 to 1924, it's easy to forget that we basically instituted an all-white immigration policy. By all-white, any new definition of who is white, to try to exclude people from the Middle East. And Eastern Europe. And, 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 and Eastern Europe and Jewish people too, of course. So uh, it wasn't, so the, the communities who were most vulnerable to famine in Mount Lebanon uh, were relying on silk and not remittances. And they mapped all of this. So I see the famine as sort of silk's long bust and changes in the global political economy and the global migration regime. So in the instability that followed the war, the father of that family I showed you died. And here's the same woman, she's hard to recognize. You see what, she's lightening her skin and, and, and straightening her hair. Mm -hmm. But she didn't feel the need to do here uh, in the first decade of the 20th century. So it's like the country becoming less hospitable to immigrants and, and Middle Eastern immigrants going from a kind of more of a safe white status to a more imperiled status in, in, in the 20s and 30s. So as comments about gender and the famine, mortality is different. Women are more resilient during times of famine for physiological reasons. Um, I looked high and low in some of those private archives in Lebanon for women's voices. 
And then towards the end of my research phase, I was within the, um, the National Archives here at Connell Park, and I found this huge stack of letters from middle, from women from middle class women during the family. This woman's describing like, her, her husband's a Protestant minister in the States. She lost contact with him. Her daughter's sick when she's writing this. So she's taken a printed letter and flipped it around, and written in colloquial Arabic in, 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 in her own handwriting on the back. So it's very kind of gut wrenching experiences of famine that show how there's like a social itinerary poor people so first and then middle class people by 1970 by the last couple of years of the war it's heartbreaking letter it is yeah yeah it's really tough, tough letter. Letter. yeah 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 that she doesn't have any clothes she says we wanted to work the silk season but there's no silk season yeah. to work her daughter has a fever and she's saying just like please i bet you send me to europe <laughs> So I want to drive home this point about class conflict to finish. Um, this is a Lebanese intellectual. He writes kind of an open letter. It's not, it's like an open letter published in a newspaper to the French general who's just taken over. And he's like kind of taking him around the city and he's saying, you're going to encounter an underage girl who will shock you, and this is in French, shock you with her air of being a prostitute. If you ask her about her family, that suggestive smile will disappear from her face and be replaced by tears. She will tell you that she comes from this village in Mount Lebanon or that neighborhood in Beirut, and that after her parents mortgaged their home and fields for a morsel of bread, they died of hunger. Then she began to pray for those same monopolist murderers of her family that she sees promenading in their rich carriages and to whom the French and English now extend their hands and whose invitations they accept. So I add this because I think there's a risk in being too sort of distant from the trauma here. Um, I think we need to drive home how horrible this was, but also the anger that you get from the source here that the old Ottoman elite does something really clever, which is, you know, says the Ottomans were Turks, we didn't have anything to do with them, and they just power right through, sign up with the French and British, and, and, and rumble on, and they were never held accountable for this, not even in the stories that were told about the famine, um, but also an actual fact, people who monopolized grain um, during, um, while, while, while there were their country people starving in the streets. So I, this is an allegory, so it wouldn't be surprising if you tell anybody from Lebanon this, like there's a corrupt elite who's robbing me. Um, this isn't just a story about Lebanon, um, but, but you know, very simply this class of people has, has been able to reproduce its power over time. This is the establishment of Greater Lebanon as the Maronite Patriarchate, and this is happening on the steps of the Sursuk Mansion, uh, one of the families involved in profiteering. So I will, in the interest of ending fully on time, just leave you with those conclusions. 